Mr. B, let's begin by sort of figuring out what kinds of things should not be bought and sold. So why don't you tell me some things that you think shouldn't be bought and sold in the market? What shouldn't be bought and sold? People? Politicians? People? So slavery? People? Politicians? Those are two different things. <laughs> Yes, those are two Maybe different weapons things. of mass destruction. I don't know if we want. Do you want your neighbor to own a nuclear device or a bacteriological uh, disease that could kill everyone? Weapons, certain kinds. I of did. Weapons. I, I, I don't. I mean, weapons of mass destruction, not sure. not guns or anything like that. Sure, I understand. So certain kinds of weapons shouldn't be bought and sold on the market. Okay. What else? Friendship. Yeah. Indian species. Then again, sorry. Indian species. Oh, very well. Okay, interesting. Jan up here said friendship. Uh, I'm just gonna say. You can uh, buy friends. Endangered species. <laughs> There's a movie going. <laughs> well, you can, but this is a question about what you ought to be able to buy and sell, not what you can buy and sell, because everything on this list so far can be bought and sold, but the question is whether or not you ought to be able to. Um, and this is like a nice beginning list. Any others? Honor. Honor? I work in the US, so I make a point of <laughs> <laughs> properly spelling everything. Anything else? Yeah, that's a pretty good list. I don't know how many of those we'll address today, but we can definitely cover some of them in the question and answer period. There are broadly two different kinds of objections to markets. One set of objections are in principle objections. So for example, we might worry about commodification in particular. And here what we're wondering about is the meaning of markets and the meaning of money. And sometimes when we buy and sell stuff, we communicate something through the purchase of those things. And some people might think that it's wrong to commodify certain things because it communicates the wrong kind of attitude. Those are in principle objections to markets. The second set of broad objections to markets are in practice objections to markets. Objections like, in a way, the corruption objection, or the wrongful exploitation objection, or the misallocation objection. Uh, wrongful exploitation, so we're worried that poor people, for example, will be taken advantage of. We might worry about sweatshops, something like that. Misallocation includes worries about inequality. So we might think that we don't want markets in everything or in some set of things, precisely because if we allow a market in those things, it'll lead to inequality that we don't like, or it'll lead to the exploitation of certain groups of people, uh, or it might corrupt the meaning of a particular kind of practice. In my talk today, I'm going to focus almost exclusively on the in-principle objections to markets, and almost not at all on the in-practice objections to markets. We have an economist in the room, and I will just turn to him, I guess, when uh, people object in practice. So here's an overview of what I'll talk about. We'll talk about the inherently wrong, and my question to you is, what's the market got to do got to do with it. The second one is the mere commodity objection. The third one is the wrong signal objection. The fourth one is the wrong currency objection to markets. And then I'll make a, a final point about market design. Different ways of designing markets that might alleviate some of your concerns or eliminate them entirely. Let's see. So here's a nice photograph. It's an actual picture an actual auction for slaves. You might think people are the sorts of things that should not be bought and sold <coughs> in the market. This is Ezio. He's an assassin. He's not a hired assassin, but it is the coolest picture of an assassin that I could find. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll do. Um, Ezio, I'm told, kills for honor. He's part of a gang, and they fight against another gang, or sets of gangs, and Ezio kills people in the other gang. I don't know, any of you play 
Assassin's Creed. Did I get that roughly right? Ballpark, yeah. Ballpark? <laughs> okay, as long as it's a big enough ballpark. Oh, okay, so you might think that assassination is the kind of thing that shouldn't be bought and sold on a market. Well, look, the thesis of the book that I'm writing and the thesis that I'm presenting to you here is as follows. If it's okay to do something for free, then it's okay to do it for money. The claim is not that like, <coughs> magically the market converts things such that you can buy and sell things that you couldn't give away or have for free. What I'm interested in is whether the market features as part of the explanation for the wrongness of some kind of uh, behavior or some kind of activity. Does that make sense? If not, then in what way is that an interesting limit on markets? So take slavery and take assassination. Well, those are things that you could not do for free. So it's not okay to buy and sell them on a market, precisely because it's not okay to do that kind of stuff for free. Yeah. When we talk about the wrongness of slavery, it's not that money's exchange that makes slavery wrong, is it? Yes. Well, okay, maybe. <laughs> But in lots of stories about why slavery is wrong, stories about autonomy feature prominently. So it would be wrong to sort of volunteer yourself. In my view, it would be wrong to volunteer yourself as a slave for another. It would be wrong to sort of give as a gift, as kings and queens sometimes did, right? It would be wrong to give a gift of a group of people as slaves, right? And so those sorts of things are inherently wrong. And markets don't add or detract anything from the moral story. So hired assassinations are out, but that's because those things are inherently wrong. Let me give you an analogy, a metaphor, to sort of make more sense of that claim. So imagine we were trying to write a book about the moral limits of hats. I could spin out a lot of things very easily about the moral limits of wearing hats. So for example, if it's immoral to lie, then it's immoral to lie and wear a hat, <laughs> right? If it's immoral to cheat, then it's immoral to cheat and wear a hat. If it's immoral to steal, then it's immoral to steal and wear a hat. But what does the hat add or subtract from the story about what's wrong with lying, cheating, and stealing? The answer is nothing. So I'm only interested in cases where we might think that the market actually adds some immorality to something that is otherwise okay, or subtracts immorality from something that we otherwise might think is wrong. So this kind of thing is trivial, right? Hats have nothing to do with the wrongness of lying, cheating, and stealing. And the same kind of claim is the one that I want to defend when it comes to market. Here's the bottom line. If it's inherently wrong, then markets add nothing to our understanding of the wrongness of those sorts of activities. So buying and selling people is out because it's inherently wrong. It would be wrong to buy and sell people, to give them away, excuse me, for free. Um, yeah. Same with assassinations. Yeah, uh, What about ownership of, of these things? I mean, assuming for a minute that I'm, I'm an owner of myself, and if I voluntarily decide to enslave myself or, or give myself over as property to some other group. Um, so we're going to have a disagreement about a lot of things here. So for example, <laughs> I think self-ownership is a mistake. I think it's a category error. Um, and I don't think it's okay for you to give yourself up to slavery. Um, I think that's wrong too. But that's in a way like a separate issue, and we can talk about that some more near the end. Let's talk about the mere commodity and the wrong signal objections. Here is the objection written out in logical form. Some X is not a mere commodity. To buy or sell X either necessarily means you regard X as a commodity, or it communicates a commodification attitude to other people. It is wrong to regard X as a commodity. It is wrong to communicate a commodification attitude towards X. Therefore, it is wrong to buy or sell those things. Let me ask you something. 
Oh, no, let me, let me quote Sandel instead. <coughs> Here's Sandel, Michael Sandel. He's probably the most famous anti-commodification <coughs> theorist at the moment. He just wrote a book about the moral limits of markets, and it's fairly popular. You can see him in TED Talks, you can see him all over the place. If you Google Michael Sandel, you can get a lot of information about this topic. He says that markets don't only allocate goods, they also express certain attitudes toward the goods being exchanged. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Anderson says something similar. She says, a practice treats something as a commodity if its production, distribution, or enjoyment is governed by one or more norms distinctive to the market. Market norms structure relations among the people who produce, distribute, and enjoy the things in question. Meanwhile, here's a kind of definition of what the commodification attitude amounts to. So this is what is constitutive of considering something a commodity. First, we deny the subjectivity of the commodity. So the commodified thing either lacks consciousness or is something whose experience and feelings need not be taken into account. So that's part of the element of the commodification attitude. Secondly, instrumentality, the commodified thing has only or mainly instrumental value. So when we think of something as a commodity, we, we deny its subjectivity, first of all, and secondly, we think of it as a merely instrumental value. And finally, fungibility. The commodified thing is replaceable with money or other objects. In fact, possessing this <coughs> object is the very same thing as possessing money. So these are the constitutive features of the commodification <coughs> attitude. That's Martha Nussbaum, by the way, and this over here is Margaret Jane Braddon. They've also written on this topic extensively. How many of you have one of these? How many of you have one of these? And how many of you have one of these? So how many of you have either a cat or a dog? And how many of you have this attitude? <laughs> Towards your pets. How many of you have this attitude? Anybody own a, a cat or dog but doesn't have this attitude? Most of my cats. Okay, okay, I understand. Uh, I have two cats. One of them is family. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we get it. The other one. This is being taped. The other one I love just as much. <laughs> necessarily follow from the fact that you bought a cat or dog 
that you will have a commodification attitude towards your caterpillar. Isn't it true that most people here in Canada and in the US regard their pets as members of their family, regardless of whether they bought them on a market or received them from an adoption or you know, had one of their other cats or dogs give birth to, to puppies or kittens? Isn't it true that there's no necessary connection between the two? Isn't it true that whether or not you bought your cat or dog has very little to do with whether or not you have a commodification attitude towards those pets. Yeah? But isn't it a fact that, isn't it a sense of fact that you can find cats and dogs to buy? Isn't that a statement of the commodification thing? Like if people wouldn't buy them, they wouldn't be sold in pet stores. <coughs> that kind of That's know? true, but do the people who buy them, are they thinking of those cats and dogs as future family members? Or are they thinking of them merely as commodities? Well, the people who buy them know, but the people around who see them, doesn't that kind of propagate the kind of commodification of pets? Oh, that's good. And we'll get to the signal that you send when you buy and sell a cat or dog in just a second. That's a good separate kind of issue. Here's Alfred C. Barnes. Right? He's a famous art collector. He was a famous art collector. He was very interested in um, Monet's and Manet's and that kind of art before anybody cared about that kind of art at all. And he made it part of his life's mission to go out in the world, in particular in France, and to buy as much of that art as possible. Uh, he went out and he bought all of that art precisely because nobody else cared about it. And he thought that it fell to him to save this significant art. Now, this is the Barnes Collection in Lower Marion in Pennsylvania. Um, that art no longer exists in the Barnes house. Um, the town council in Lower Marion voted to move it to the big city. And now they've constructed, reconstructed Barnes's home in downtown Philadelphia, I think it is. <laughs> Even though Alfred P. Barnes was a weird kind of guy, he was obsessed with um, a hatred for his local town council. And so he said, in his will, he said, you may never move this art. This art may never go anywhere except for right in here. And the first thing they did after his death is they started the process of trying to move his art into downtown Philadelphia. Now, Alfred Barnes bought all this art not because he regarded it as of merely instrumental value. In fact, he thought that this work of art was beyond any kind of financial consideration. It had more than merely economic value. And yet, he had that attitude despite the fact that he participated in the market for art. And he participated in the market for art very aggressively. He bought a lot of art. Um, some, people tell, uh, some people say that this collection of art is the single most expensive collection of art in the world. That it is more valuable than the Louvre in Paris. And notice here, McGill and other schools have a human resources department. In a way, that's kind of interestingly named. It's a human resources department. The professors that teach you are hired. They're paid to teach you. And yet, what kind of attitude do you have towards your professors? And what kind of attitude do you think us professors have towards you as students? Do you think the fact that we're paid somehow makes it the case that we have the wrong attitude towards students? Is the fact that you pay tuition, does that alter in any way the attitude you have towards your professors? I think the answer is no, but uh, there are, are always exceptions. There are actually two senses of commodity that sometimes get run together. One sense of commodity is anything that is bought and sold on a market. Strictly speaking, anything that is bought and sold on a market is a commodity. But there's a difference between something being a commodity and having a commodification attitude towards that thing. To have the commodification attitude is to have an attitude where we deny the subjectivity, attach merely or only instrumental value to that object, good, thing, 
um, or cat or dog, and regard that thing as fungible. But the two can come apart. So even though, strictly speaking, all the art that Alfred Barnes bought was a commodity, Alfred Barnes did not have the commodification attitude towards those objects. And even though, strictly speaking, every cat and dog that you, that you buy in a pet store is a commodity, it doesn't automatically follow, it doesn't necessarily follow, that you will have a commodification attitude towards that cat and that dog. But, like, yeah. Aren't your expectations radically different when you pay for something? For example, if I was to go to university and pay for it, my boss didn't know anything, I'd be more upset than if I was there for free. I wasn't paying for it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the dog. If I, got it, I bought a dog and I realized, you know, a week later that it's going to die of some disease, I'd probably want to take it back or hold the person sold to be accountable. Whereas if it was for free, I'd have a tendency to <coughs> say, well, I didn't pay for it, so whatever. Yeah, you're right. I mean, our expectations will change depending on whether or not we buy um, the thing. But it's not a necessary connection. We might not of necessity have that kind of attitude. Here, I'm responding to those people who claim that there's a necessary connection between the two. Now, if the connection is contingent, then it might be based on some other features. And we can spend some more time talking about it, because I think there's something that I'll say a little bit later on that touches on the point that you're making here. So the bottom line here for this part is the following. There is no necessary connection between buying and selling X and any mode of valuation, including the commodification attitude. Buying a cat doesn't mean of necessity that you have a commodification attitude towards a cat. Buying art doesn't mean that either with respect to art. Human resources departments at places like McGill and other places, they don't signal, well, they might signal, but it doesn't mean from the fact that there's a human resources department that administration has a commodification attitude towards the professors that work here. And now we can ask about the signal that it sends. Right? So even though it's true that the people who participate in the market may not have a commodification attitude towards the things that they are buying or selling, it might be true that we communicate that attitude to other people. Right? So people who engage in buying or selling a cat or dog might communicate that they have a commodification attitude even if they don't. Right? Here's the wrong signal objection. Buying and selling certain objects tends to express certain morally deplorable attitudes. This expression occurs independently of any attitudes that the person may happen to have. If so, then commodifying certain objects is wrong. Therefore, commodifying certain objects is wrong. Uh, let me tell you a story about King Darius of Persia. Here's King Darius. And he gathered the Colossians and the Greeks, and he was curious about their funeral practices. And he said, my people respect their fathers. We all want to publicly signal our respect. But the Greeks do different things from the Galatians. I'll get them here, and I'll ask them both about their practices. And he said, Greeks, you respect your fathers. And yes, of course, in the areas we respect our fathers. Tell me, how do you demonstrate that respect at a funeral? And the Greeks sort of scratched their heads. And they said, King Darius, we burn our fathers on a funeral pyre. Right? I mean, that's so obvious when you think about it. You burn them on a funeral pyre. Funeral pyres signal respect for the dead. After all, a funeral pyre releases their souls into the afterlife. And if you just sort of think about it for a second, it should be obvious to everybody in the world that the right thing to do upon a funeral is to burn the deceased. And King David is pressed and he said, would you ever eat your fathers? 
and the Greeks were outraged. King Darius, that idea is disgusting to us. To eat them would be to disrespect them. It would be to treat them as mere food. It would corrupt the meaning of funerals. King Darius was satisfied, and he said, Galatians, you respect your fathers. And the Galatians, of course, not. And said, yes, of course. King Darius, we respect our fathers. Tell me, how do you demonstrate that respect at a funeral? And the Galatians said, well, duh, King Darius, we eat the hearts of our fathers. Eating the heart signals respect for the dead. After all, to eat the heart of your father is to keep your father with you for all times. Like, what happens if you just leave them in the ground? They're not with you. But if you eat their heart, then your father will be with you for all time. How respectful is that? It's the pinnacle of respect. And King Darius pressed and he said, Would you ever burn your fathers on a funeral pyre? The Colossians were outraged. King Darius, that idea is repugnant to us. To burn them would be to disrespect them. It would be to treat them like mere trash. Something else we burn. We burn garbage. It would corrupt the meaning of funerals. Here's the bottom line from that little story. There is no deep metaphysical fact about what markets mean, just as there is no deep metaphysical fact about what those funeral practices mean. It is a contingent fact a mere convention. But what about money? Here's the wrong currency objection spelled out in logical form. Money communicates distance and estrangement. There are some relationships, romantic partners between fellow citizens, friendships, etc., <coughs> where it would be morally wrong to communicate a kind of estrangement, a kind of distance. If so, then using money within certain kinds of relationships is wrong. Therefore, using money within certain kinds of relationships is wrong. So you can just imagine what would happen if you went to a friend's house and he or she treated you to dinner. And then at the end of dinner, you pulled out your wallet and by way of thanks, you handed them a 20. How would they feel about that? They would probably be pretty offended you're not supposed to give money as a sign of thanks between friends. Here's Terence Mitchell and Amy Mickel. They describe our attitude towards money in this way in the conventional, i.e. contemporary Western economic perspective. Money is viewed as a utilitarian commodity that is ordinary, it's mundane, it is impersonal, and it's neutral. It is profane with only quantitative meanings. Is that true? Well, consider the marina of Madagascar. These are the marina of Madagascar. Here, if you wanted your significant other, if you wanted to show gratitude for having sex with your significant other, it would be weird, wouldn't it? if you paid them. In a way, it would signal a certain kind of attitude towards your significant other, right? In a way, they might be offended because they might think that you're treating them very much like a prostitute. Now, is that a necessary feature of money used in personal relationships? Some people think that that's so, but the marina of Madagascar, I think, stand as a counter to that thought. In this culture, it's expected and it's respectful to leave a gift of money under the pillow of the women you have sex with. 
And within this culture, they don't regard it in any way as disrespectful. The men follow this practice even with their wives. It is expected. It is regarded as a gift. And within this culture, I am told, it is regarded as perfectly appropriate and perfectly respectful. They don't think that money signals that kind of distance. In fact, leaving a gift of money brings you further closer to your wife or to, well, Madagascar prostitution is okay amongst the people, amongst the marina, and so they do that as well. The thing that distinguishes whether or not you have sex with a prostitute um, and whether or not you're having sex with somebody that you care very much about is usually the amount of money that is left and not the fact that money is left. So the amount of money that you leave signals the particular kind of relationship that you're in, whether it's a prostitutional exchange of money for sex or it's a kind of gift that you give to your wife or to your significant other to demonstrate that you respect and have a certain amount of gratitude for the sex that you just had with that person. Here, meanwhile, is a Romanian funeral. And you might think that if you were to pay someone to attend your father's funeral or your mother's funeral, you might think that in a way that communicates a kind of disrespect to your mother or your father. But that's not true in Romania. In Romania, it is expected that the son will pay a lot of people to attend the funeral of his father or son. In fact, just recently I discovered that in China, there are professional mourners. There's like a category of job, a career that you can, you can have called a professional mourner. Yeah, Sarah. Oliver Twist is a professional mourner uh, at, at the beginning of um, Dickens' novel. Is that right? Yes, he's, a, oh, okay. he's an official mute who will come to these funeral sessions and looks sad. That's amazing. And Oliver Twist is paid for that? Uh, well, the people who run the, the funeral company. Yeah. Oh, OK. okay. So yeah. yeah, you should have a look at that. Uh, yeah, Oliver Twist. All right, I'll use yeah. Oliver Twist. Yeah. In Romania, it's the same thing. You don't pay just people to show up. Mm -hmm. You're mourners, which will like, show respect and all that, because the family can't afford to stay and cry. Find yep. their loved one, because they need to work at nice things and take care of things. So you just pay people. Oh, okay. okay. So there are people who are paid to mourn, right? Now here in our culture, like, if I was to do something like that, I think most people would, would kind of throw their brows and be upset about my paying someone to attend my dad's or my mom's funeral. But in Romania, that kind of thing is okay. There are mourners who are paid. And in China, like I was beginning to say, there are professional mourners. And there's one woman in particular who's really excellent at and she, and the stories are pretty, they're pretty elaborate. She will like fall to the floor and just crawl on the floor towards the casket of somebody she's never met. She doesn't know this person. And she will scream to the heavens, she will say, why? Why have you been taken from us? It is too soon. And she collapses around the casket and the family of the deceased can cry. And the people really admire her abilities. She really gets the crowd to cry off. And they say, you know, somebody like that is really important. Because for the rest of us who are standing there at the funeral, sometimes it's very difficult to start to cry. Right? You're just sort of standing there. You really need the release of tears. And to have a professional mourner really exaggerate the mourning gives everyone permission to just start to cry. At least that's what I'm told. Here's a little experiment that you can do with anything, right? With almost anything that we buy and sell. Do a little twin earth experiment to discover whether what you're worried about is a certain kind of etiquette or whether or not you're really concerned with something that matters um, with respect to ethics. So here's our Canada. Right? Uh, no, reverse. This is our Canada, and this is Twin Canada. In our Canada, we make wedding speeches. We write them ourselves, and we deliver them ourselves. We buy birthday presents. We buy flowers as gifts. 
and we buy dinner on Valentine's Day. And all of these things we think, well, of course, that's natural. All of this makes sense. No problem. Right? But now consider Twin Canada. And on Twin Canada, they pay for wedding speeches. Michael Sandel has a really nice section in his book where he laments the fact that there are these websites where you can buy wedding speeches. And he's just really upset about it. My God, don't these people respect you know, the people that are getting married? How can you pay for a wedding speech? It's $149, by the way, for a wedding speech. Um, you can customize it if you want. There are many options. It's $149.99. So imagine on like Twin Canada, they pay for wedding speeches, and they make birthday presents, and they grow flowers as gifts, and they make dinner on Valentine's Day. <laughs> and tell me which of these Canada's is the moral one and which the immoral one? Or is it all just a convention that's contingent, that's up to us? If we want to be polite, then we do these things. If we want to be polite and nice, we do these things here. On Twin Canada, if you want to be polite and nice, you do those things. But notice that in neither of these places are we talking about ethics. We're just talking about etiquette, nice things to do. It's not unethical to pay for a wedding speech. It's just uncouth. It's not done here. It would violate etiquette surrounding wedding speeches. Now you can imagine Sandel, now here, here on earth, he says, some people buy wedding speeches. Can you believe it? Don't they see how this is disrespectful? But you can imagine Twin Sandel on Twin North America, I'll say it. Thank you. Some people write their own wedding speeches. Can you believe it? Don't they see how this is disrespectful? I don't think either one of these would be incoherent or weird. And that just signals that we're talking about etiquette and not ethics. So kind of, you know, the Dear Abby columns. Like if you're, if you're in England, don't do this, right? Right? Anybody from England? Australia, where's my friend from Australia? Yeah, is this the... Is that, what, what is the, is this? No, it's this. It's this? What is it? It's this? Yeah. Okay, yeah. When in Australia, don't do this, right? When in England, don't do this, right? Here, don't do this. But is there some fact about, like, the difference between this, this, or this that makes this immoral? But this is like, could it be otherwise? Of course it could have been otherwise. It's just a contingent feature of our culture, and we can change it. Look, uh, I'll run an experiment right here. Let's agree between all of us that when I do this, I mean I respect you as a person. Can we agree to that? Can we agree to that private convention here in this room? Yes? Are we agreed? Adam. Peter. Matt. Did we do something immoral? Of course not. It's just a social convention that attaches a bad meaning to this gesture. And so similarly, there's a social convention about paying for wedding speeches versus writing them yourselves. Those conventions can change, and they are contingent, and we're just talking about etiquette and not ethics. And in fact, it turns out that money has many different meanings. I gave you a quote from Terence and Amy Mickle, Terence Mitchell and Amy Mickle at the beginning. They talked about the meaning of money as being this kind of impersonal, distant, and fungible thing with only profane meanings. But it turns out that sociologists who study empirically the history of the use of money have discovered that money has many different meanings in different contexts. Here's Vivian Salazar, she's no slouch. She's the chair of the Department of Sociology at Princeton University. And she tells us that uh, money has at least three different kinds of meanings. It can mean 
Uh, it can be a form of compensation, so a kind of direct exchange. It can have the meaning of being a kind of entitlement, so the right to a particular share. And as a gift, it's possible for money to function as a gift. One person's bestowal on another. Money as compensation implies an equal exchange of values and a certain kind of distance, uh, a certain kind of contingency, maybe some kind of bargaining and accountability among the parties. So your question earlier, right, about what we expect when we pay for something. Well, it depends on whether or not we regard the purchase of a cat as a kind of, right, uh, well, compensation that would be entitled to. Money as an entitlement implies strong claims to power and autonomy by the recipient. So if you interpret your exchange for the cat as an exchange that means a certain kind of entitlement that you have, then you're going to have that attitude. But you can regard it differently. Right? And in a way, it's optional and up to you. You could, if you wanted to, go to a pet store and conceive of the money as a kind of gift that you give in exchange for the gift of a pet, if you wanted to. Suppose your attitude towards cats and dogs was that they're super special creatures, and that someone giving you a cat or a dog in exchange for money is actually gifting you a cat or dog in some special way to create the scenario yourself. Money as a gift implies intimacy and or inequality, plus a certain kind of arbitrariness. And at different times, we have regarded different things as uh, uh, money has meant different things over time. So in the 1920s, for example, parents used to give their children money as a gift. And it was considered special. Nowadays, we give Hallmark cards to each other. Tell me, isn't that similar to paying for a wedding speech in at least certain relevant respects? Right? We don't write, we pick out those Hallmark cards. And yeah, it's true that when I get a Hallmark card, I don't always think of it as special. Right? But if the person is like, I love you, Jimmy, or whatever, and stamps that on the card and gives it to me, then I'm like, oh, that's nice. And if the poem written on the Hallmark card somehow relates to me or makes sense to me in some way, then I'm like, that's additionally special. Thank you for buying me that Hallmark card. <laughs> And if I were given a gift of money, I'd be like, wow, that's great. <laughs> Perfect. Now, Michael Sandel tells this story about an Oxford professor of his who, at the end of one semester, one of his students walked up to him and said, you know, great job, professor. Here's a 20. Here's a 10. You know, he, like, tried to tip the Oxford professor. This is a, this is a story recounted by Michael Sandel. And the Oxford professor was outraged, like, completely outraged. And he shares this story with Michael Sandel, and Michael Sandel and the Oxford professor, both of them nod to each other like, yes, of course, this is just such an outrage. It's morally bad. It clearly means that the student has the wrong attitude towards education. Really? Really? Is that true? Or is it really true that the student intended to communicate a respectful kind of gratitude? It's just that the Oxford professor and Michael Sandel are so stubbornly attached to their own interpretive schema, that they can't see money as a gift. They just can't see it. For them, money means one and only one sort of thing. Yeah. If that's your banker, that's OK. <laughs> right. A student of mine recently gave me a bottle of like Maker's Mark whiskey. And I actually, I mean, it's made me a little uncomfortable at the time. I wasn't sure what the etiquette was. But after a little while, I was like, you know, the student really meant to communicate that he was grateful. And I should accept the gift as communicating that meaning. I shouldn't infer that the student thinks I'm a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> or that he thinks that, that all the education that I gave him is equivalent to this alcohol. <laughs> what does he think of education? That it's as good as whiskey? Come on. <laughs> Martha Nussbaum says something very similar to you. Uh, she tells us about the other sorts of things that we accept money for. Women accept money for all sorts of quote unquote bodily services. If you're worried about prostitution, for example, women accept money for all sorts of bodily services. Factory workers, domestic servants, nightclub singers, masseuses, and professors of philosophy. That's me. 
who take money for thinking and writing about what they think. Right? I, I take money and I have a salary. The Oxford professor doesn't volunteer his time at Oxford. He gets a salary. And he can try to fool himself, but that salary comes from tuition. <laughs> Students are paying him to do what he does. It's just that we have this elaborate ritual. It's so indirect. You pay tuition. What proportion of your tuition goes towards the salary of the particular professors that teach you? Do you know? Who knows? Some portion of your tuition goes towards like upkeep of the buildings and the facilities. Some portion of it goes towards, apparently not snow removal, but maybe at some <laughs> colleges they use it for snow removal. Some portion goes towards the professor. And really, if we wanted to, we could have a system where like, as the students walk in, they hand the professor a check. It's like, this is your portion of the tuition. This, is, this will cover your salary. We don't like that. And one thing about professionals in general is that they distance themselves from the payment. When I go to the doctor, I don't pay the doctor. I don't say, thanks, Jim, here's $200. Jim says, OK, Peter, that's great. Now go talk to my secretary. And I walk over there, and the secretary is like, that'll be $200. I'm like, well, that was an inefficient exchange. Like, why didn't, you, why didn't the doctor just tell me how much it was? And I could have just handed him the money right there. But philosophers and others take money for all sorts of bodily work. And the, the professor of philosophy takes money for thinking and writing about what she thinks, about morality, about emotion, all parts of the human being's intimate search for understanding of the world and self-understanding. We take money for those things, but we don't worry about it too much. There's no reason to think that a prostitute's acceptance of money for her services necessarily involves a baneful conversion of an intimate act into a commodity. The fact that you pay your professors to be professors doesn't somehow convert your relationship with your professor into an exchange of commodities, mere commodities. Bottom line, the meaning of money as a gift, as an entitlement, as a kind of compensation is also contingent. It's a convention. Money for sex doesn't have to signal disrespect or distance. The marina of Madagascar managed to use money and not signal those things. Um, paying mourners at a funeral doesn't have to, as the case of Romania and China and Oliver Twist demonstrate. Buying a wedding speech doesn't have to communicate those things either, as the case of Twin America demonstrates. It's not immoral. It is at best bad manners. It's a taboo. Let me make a final point about market design. So now look, um, many studies appear to show that, our, that extrinsic rewards, like money, for example, can crowd out our intrinsic motivation. The most famous case started with Titmus's book in 1970 called The Gift Relationship where he demonstrated or he um, suggested that if people were paid for donating blood, there would be less blood donation. Um, your intrinsic motivation to donate blood would be crowded out by the money. So paying for blood, it turns out that women do it less often. Men don't. Then you pay them for blood, they'll donate blood just as much. But it turns out for some reason, I don't know why, that women do it much less if you pay them. Um, if you pay students to study or to work hard or whatever, um, it turns out that a lot of students will put in less effort, which is really kind of unusual. If you pay, you know, Michael Sandel tells us that there are kids who get paid for reading, and he worries that it might replace the love of reading with the love of money. I put a question mark there because he doesn't look at any empirical evidence to buttress his points, but you could easily study this kind of thing with empirical evidence. Maybe being late to pick up your kids, so an Israeli daycare center instituted a fine for being late uh, for picking up the kids, and guess what happened? People showed up even later, <laughs> and more often, they were late. Weird. And it turns out that with cognitively taxing tasks, sometimes if we pay them a certain amount by way of a bonus, 
they will actually perform a lot worse than, a, than people who are paid a much smaller reward. So what do you conclude? Are there some things that money shouldn't buy? Well, no, right? Design compensation schemes differently. Change the design of the compensation scheme. Maybe, maybe prostitution communicates the wrong kind of attitude. Well, okay, what if the prostitute had a secretary and she performed her professional task and then sent you to the secretary to collect the money? Would that improve the market? I don't know. We can always try. What's that? Because there's the secretary. Yeah, but a pimp, I, I really like to design pimping out <laughs> market for sex. I think that's probably a problem. So it turns out, look, it turns out that the effect of the limited donation of blood entirely disappears if you give women the option of donating the money that they would have received to charity. That's a form of payment for blood, except the woman doesn't receive the payment. She gets to volunteer that money to a charity. Similarly with grades, the effect of crowding out entirely disappears if the money signals a kind of competence. So if you get paid for competence, then you will work harder. But if you are paid just to work hard, then you will work less. How about reading? Well, OK, let's change the design and pay with candy rather than money. Will that substitute a love of candy for a love of reading, Lear? Right? Or maybe give them more video game time. Who knows? Whatever. We can construct a market for reading. We just got to change some of the variables. Being late to pick up your kids? OK, raise the price. Sometimes a low price signals that it's no big deal. So if you increase the price, it might signal this is serious. Pick up your kids. Cognitively taxing tasks, it turns out that you have to pay enough or not pay at all. But it's not inconsistent with markets. You just have to up the price. It's not the how is the point here. It's the what. When paying people attend to the language of money. I have what, like a minute left? Less than a minute? And then questions. Well, this is the last point, and that's right the level. Markets and kidneys, you and I are going to think, probably are repugnant. Is that a problem with markets as such? Is that a problem with the fact that we're paying for a kidney? Or is that a problem with the way that we have designed markets for kidneys? So let's agree to treat repugnance as a negative externality. And why don't you and I try to construct a market that would make you feel no repugnance at all. Can we design a market that limits or eliminates the feeling of repugnance? So that would be the question I'll end on. And we can, we can try together to construct just such a market. Can you?